It's definitely, as we were just saying, definitely very much a Monday for us on this call. Um, so thank you for coming to this webinar. It's part of our Preconception Coin webinar series. It's going to be focusing on cannabis and women's health with Dr. Becky Lynn. Um, as you all note, um, the webinar is being recorded and it will be archived on our beforeandbeyond.org website. Um, and then we will also have an evaluation link at the end of the webinar for you to share or for you to provide feedback. Um, just as a brief reminder for our Preconception Coin Project, our goal is to develop, implement, and disseminate a woman-centered, clinician-engaged, community-evolved approach to the Well Woman Visit to improve the preconception health status of women of reproductive age, particularly low-income women and women of color. And I'm gonna turn it over to your colleague, Dara Patel, to introduce Dr. Lynn. Hey everybody. So just to let you know a little bit more about Dr. Lynn, Dr. Lynn is the founder and CEO of Avora Women's Health, as well as an adjunct associate professor of obstetrics and gynecology at St. Louis University. Dr. Lynn is a leader in the women's health and cannabis space. She teaches the pharmacology of cannabis and her research focuses on the effects of cannabis on sexual function in women. She's published papers in the scientific literature and has presented her research both nationally and internationally, both at the ISSWSH conference in Atlanta and at the International Society for the Study of Sexual Medicine conference in Beijing, China. Dr. Lin has been featured in numerous podcasts and several articles in the cannabis space. So most recently she's filmed and recorded for both MTV documentary and to the Huffington Post podcast on cannabis and sex. Her um, articles, the relationship between marijuana used prior to sex and sexual function women and effects of cannabinoids on female sexual function can be found online. Dr. Lynn completed medical school at Georgetown University School of Medicine in Washington, DC and completed her residency at Washington University at St. Louis and participated it, or practice, sorry, at the University of Missouri in Columbia before joining the faculty at St. Louis University in 2015 where she's been full-time faculty since 2020. After leaving SLU, she founded the Evora Women's Health Clinic in February, 2020. And in addition, she's completed her sexual counselor training at Sexual Medicine Associates in Florida, and she completed her MBA at St. Louis University. Dr. Lynn enjoys running, foreign language and travel. And a fun fact is she once rode her bike from London to Paris to raise money for breast cancer care. Thank you all for joining us. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully I can get the technology to work. So, all right. Um, so I'm Dr. Lynn, and I just want to say thank you so much for having me. Um, I obviously I'm biased. This is, in my opinion, an important topic, um, but this is where healthcare is going in more and more states are, you know, legalizing medical marijuana and recreational marijuana. So more of our patients are going to be using it. And we need to know what the data shows when we counsel our patients um, and give them the tools that they need to be healthy. So thank you for having me. Um, I love to talk. I am so I have some disclosures. I speak for a variety of drug companies. Um, I'm just a talker. So um, the way I've laid this out is we'll run through some basics, some definitions, um, because there's a lot of uh, terminology that you don't learn in school um, that we need to know what it means. And then um, we will go through the second part of the talk is we'll go through um, a, how cannabis specifically affects certain aspects of women's health, like the menstrual cycle, fertility, pregnancy, lactation. And then at the end, I wanna talk a little bit about how you actually prescribe uh, cannabis um, and how you do that varies state by state. But um, what do you recommend when your patients come to you and say, what should I do with this medicine? Um, so that's kind of how I've laid it out, but let's start with some definitions. Um, there's a plant called cannabis sativa. Um, that is a plant. Um, so when we talk about cannabis, we mean the plant and in within that plant, there are a whole bunch of cannabinoids. So THC is one of them. THC is the chemical compound, the cannabinoid that gets you high if you smoke cannabis or use cannabis. Um, marijuana has fallen out of favor as a term. Um, it didn't used to be out of favor. Um, so my papers, which came out a couple of years ago, used the term marijuana. And sometimes I slip into using it by accident. Um, but really the correct term nowadays is cannabis. 
Um, CBD is another cannabinoid in the cannabis plant. But like I said, there are lots of different cannabinoids in the cannabis plant. Um, and when I say endocannabinoids, I mean that these are the natural ligands for the cannabinoid receptor. So we have receptors in our body that THC and CBD bind to, but we have ligands and things in our body that are meant to bind to that. Um, and those are endocannabinoids. We'll talk about those too. So here's a nice pretty picture of a cannabis plant. Um, what uh, it's when we say cannabis, it's these dried flowers of the cannabis plant, and you can use cannabis in a variety of ways. So joints, bongs, blunts, brewed tea, vapes, edibles, tinctures. There's just, if you can think of a way to get it into your body, somebody in the cannabis space has made that product. So what about cannabis use in the U.S.? So um, it is the most commonly used psychotropic drug in the United States after alcohol. Um, and in 2018, more than 11.8 million young adults reported cannabis use in the past year. And interestingly, men are more likely than women to use. This slide um, kind of, it shows you the share of consumers in the US who currently smoke marijuana, 7% of women, 13% of men. So more men than women. Um, and you know, you can, you can develop, if you're a cannabis user, you can develop a cannabis use disorder. So that's not to say that it can't be safely used as a medicine, but yes, some people will go on to have a problem using cannabis. Um, and according to this data, 30% will develop a cannabis use disorder. People who begin using at a younger age before the age of 18 are four to seven times more likely to develop a cannabis use disorder than people who start when they're adults. And dependence can occur as the brain adapts by reducing production of and sensitivity to its own endocannabinoids. So, so just like any drug, it can be used in a way that's not healthy. Um, as far as some more differences between men and women, cannabis is the third most common primary drug of abuse for women entering treatment for substance abuse. And women appear to be more sensitive to the behavioral and physiologic effects of cannabis. And women seeking treatment for cannabis use disorder report more severe withdrawal symptoms than men. And as we'll get to it, um, how cannabis affects the body depends on the hormonal milieu. So it's not surprising that women are going to respond and react a little bit differently than men. One thing I want to point out, cannabis is not for teenagers um, because it affects brain development. Um, it can impair thinking, memory, and learning long term. Um, it can impair thinking and memory, even for adults. So I want to now turn a little bit to the history of how we got to where we are today and how we figured out and learned about the endocannabinoid system and THC and CBD. So cannabis has been around for eons and used as a medicine for eons in numerous cultures. Um, and you know, we, we've had this knowledge about the cannabis plant for a long time, but it wasn't until 1964 that Raphael Matulam in Israel isolated THC, which is the component in the cannabis plant that causes the high. So that was, you know, big news. Yeah, he figured out the chemical structure of THC. Um, after that, at uh, St. Louis University School of Medicine um, in 1988, the first cannabinoid receptor was discovered, and that was called CB1. So we figured out what THC was, but we didn't know what it bound to in the human body until 1988. CB1 receptors are the most abundant type of receptor in the brain. But because now we found a CB1 receptor, then the question is, well, what natural substance in your body is supposed to bind to the CB1 receptor? Because we had no idea that an endocannabinoid system existed. So the next thing that was discovered was anandamide. This is the first endocannabinoid that was discovered. Um, ananda is Sanskrit for bliss, so that's where the name comes from. It regulates feeding, sleeping, pain relief, and really works in your reward center, in your brain. It's released under stress. Um, physical exercise boosts anandamide. Um, 
anandamide levels. And so some people think this is the explanation of the runner's high. So people who run, I'm a big runner, um, and feel so good after running um, that maybe that's due to higher anandamide levels caused by exercise. Um, anandamide protects neurons, facilitates neurogenesis, and the creation of new brain cells in adult mammals. And every animal with a nervous system produces anandamide. The next receptor that was discovered was naturally called CB2. This receptor is present throughout the immune system, the peripheral nervous system, metabolic tissue, and in many internal organs. So the, the cannabinoid receptors, we always think, oh, they're in the brain because, you know, if you use cannabis, you know, it, you have all these effects in, in your brain. Um, but actually, cannabinoid receptors are all throughout your body. And anandamide has a very weak affinity for CB2. And so that led to the discovery of 2AG, which is the other main endocannabinoid, because we were like, well, if it only weakly binds, what is binding strongly to CB2? So 2AG, it's more potent, more prevalent, more broadly expressed throughout the body and present in high levels in the nervous system as well. So this graph just shows you the distribution of CB1 and CB2 receptors. They're all over. Like the endocannabinoid system, we didn't really know about this before the 1960s, but it plays a huge role in the human body. So what does it do? So the role of the endocannabinoid system is to maintain homeostasis, to keep things in balance. It's part of cell signaling or how one cell tells another cell to do something. So some examples are um, body temperature. So our bodies are designed to be a set point. We're not reptiles, <laughs> you know, we're not cold blooded. Um, so if we're somewhere and it's really hot out, then our cells need to tell each other, hey, you've got to sweat, you've got to uh, vasodilate, bring the blood vessels to the surface to release heat, because we're constantly trying to get back to that narrow range of body temperature that keeps us in balance. And so it makes sense then that um, there is a product um, called Epidiolex, which is a CBD, it's not THC, it's just CBD, but it is FDA approved for certain types of seizures in kids because seizures, if you think about that homeostasis idea, these nerves are firing, 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 and you want it, the CBD can bring them back to the resting state. So just a quick review about agonists and antagonists. Um, an agonist is a drug that occupies receptors and turns them on, activates them. Antagonists are drugs that occupy receptors, but block, block them, so they don't activate them. So THC and CBD differ in their receptor actions. So THC is a partial agonist at CB1 and CB2 receptors. CBD is a partial antagonist at CB1 receptors. So that becomes important because CBD can block some of the effects of THC. This is called the entourage effect, and we'll talk about this as we get a little further into the talk. But when you think about CBD, they block their blockers at the CB receptor, which is a little bit counterintuitive, but they are. Um, but CBD is a serotonin agonist. And so it does affect um, the amounts of endogenous cannabinoids, but not by directly binding to the, C, the CB receptors. And then just to point out some of these synthetic cannabinoids like street drugs, like K2 and spice, these are full agonists at CB receptors. So they can cause some real, real problems and weird reactions. I just wanna to touch on CBD a little bit only because this is everywhere now. And if you look on the internet, it will, some website somewhere will tell you it fixes everything, which we know is not true. You have to keep in mind that CBD is not regulated like products that have THC in them. So you have to be really careful. I know the FDA has done studies where they um, sampled different CBD products and some of them had no CBD. Some of them were all THC. So you, you know, it, you, it's, it's difficult to know for the lay person what, you know, what is, what is good CBD versus not. So you have to be careful. 
Um, it's the second major component in the cannabis plant, and it does not cause psychoactivity. Um, but like I mentioned, it acts as an entourage molecule, molecule, reducing the effects of the THC. And it regulates the, the negative effects like tachycardia, anxiety, sedation, and, hung, and hunger in humans and rats. CBD itself um, does have anti-anxiety and antipsychotic properties. Um, it modulates the metabolism of THC by blocking its conversion to the more psychoactive 11-hydroxy-THC. It's an antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, immunomodulatory effects. And I, I think that's why it's marketed as the cure-all for everything. But the data is not there for CBD, right? Like there's some data not great data, but, you know, you have to be careful when you look at, at websites that tell you that it fixes everything, because if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. So now I'm going to turn to women's health and talk about cannabinoids and endocannabinoids and the role that they play in women's health. Um, and I've divided it, divided it into menstrual cycle, fertility, pregnancy, pelvic pain, and sexual function. And this is really a look at the data, what we know. So the female reproductive system has the highest concentration of endocannabinoid receptors after the brain, making women particularly responsive to the medicinal properties of the plant. And the endocannabinoid system is all over the reproductive tract. It's in the ovary, the fallopian tubes, the myometrium, the endometrium, and the expression of CB receptors um, in the endometrium and levels of anandamide and FAAH is an enzyme that, um, that affects anandamide. These levels change throughout the menstrual cycle. So let's now talk about exogenous cannabinoids. What do they do to the menstrual cycle itself? So um, we'll start with some animal studies. Studies in animals show that cannabis affects ovulation in that it delays ovulation or it prevents ovulation. And it does that by decreasing the release of GnRH. So um, here's uh, from an animal study uh, by Brent. Um, they looked at rhesus monkeys and gave them daily inject injections of Delta 9 THC. So I use the term Delta 9 THC interchangeably with THC. It's Delta 9 is just that's the location where a certain chemical group is, but I use them interchangeably. Um, there's now a Delta-8 THC that's around. If you have questions about that, I can answer those later. But T when I say THC, I mean Delta-9. So they gave these monkeys the equivalent of five to six joints during the follicular phase, and they found that this delayed or prevented ovulation. They also found that prolonged exposure of THC in the rhesus monkeys led to tolerance, and after several months, the menstrual cycle went back to normal. With animal studies, most studies use Delta-9 THC only instead of cannabis, which contains hundreds of cannabinoids, and not only cannabinoids, it contains terpenoids and flavonoids, which may be having an effect. Um, so these are difficult to generalize. They're not very generalizable to a human, but it, it's all we have. Um, and the other thing to keep in mind is that the most, most of the rhesus monkey studies used a dose that was comparable to heavy use of marijuana. So what about not so heavy use, mild use of marijuana or infrequent use? When you look at what studies are available on humans, um, there was this North Carolina early pregnancy study, and they found that women who use cannabis have a slightly elevated rate of anovulatory cycles. Um, um, and so women who use cannabis, they, they did note that it translates over to humans. The issue is that, you know, they were, these were sort of questionnaire. This is not a double blind randomized placebo controlled trial. So there's no way to control for the amount of cannabis used or to control for other things, other substances and other conditions that could affect the menstrual cycle. So this picture just illustrates where cannabinoids, exogenous cannabinoids can affect the menstrual cycle and they do so at the hypothalamus. So they prevent, they prevent the hypothalamus from making GnRH, which tells the anterior pituitary not to make LH and FSH, which tells the ovaries not to make estrogen and progesterone. 
But I find this part interesting. There is a bi-directional effect. So not only do exogenous cannabinoids affect estrogen and progesterone levels, estrogen and progesterone levels play a role in the effects that cannabis has on the body. So they study this in rats and estrogen enhance the ability of cannabis to lessen pain. So they do this by, they have rats and they, they do an oophorectomy. They take out the ovaries and they see, they look at the effects of cannabis. And then um, in those rats, they'll give them um, hormones back. They'll give them estrogen back and then see the effects of cannabis when there is estrogen available and there's differences. But with animal studies, animals are different than humans. Animal experiments are very well controlled. You know, the dose, the root, the timing, I kind of touched on this already. This may not approximate how humans use cannabis or the type of cannabis used. And you can't control for lifestyle use of other drugs, tobacco, things like that. So it's a start, but more research is needed. So let's turn to um, the effects of exogenous cannabinoids on fertility and the role of endogenous cannabinoids in fertility. So interestingly, the ETS is prominent when it comes to getting pregnant and staying pregnant. So implantation depends on appropriate exp expression of the endocannabinoid system during conception and the peri-implantation period. And transport of a fertilized egg from the tube to the uterus depends on CB1 receptors. Tubes that lack CB1 retain the zygotes. They get stuck in the tube, resulting in failed pregnancies in mice. And reduced CB1 receptor expression in the fallopian tube is associated with ectopic pregnancies in humans. Um, so they actually looked at this in women with ectopic pregnancies and women without ectopic pregnancies and noticed that there was a difference in the expression of the CB1 receptor. Um, we know that the ovary makes anandamide, which plays a role in growing ovarian follicles each month. All of this has to work in tandem to get pregnant and stay pregnant. Anandamide levels increase up to the point of ovulation, so it might be playing a role in ovulation as well. And implantation depends on having the right amount of anandamide in the uterus. So I feel like the research is giving us these little bits and pieces. Here's what we know. Here's what we know. Here's what we know but we're still sorting out how the whole mechanism works. Um, the placenta, the development of the placenta also appears to be regulated by the endocannabinoid system. There are endocannabinoids and endocannabinoid receptors in the placenta. So what happens if things get disrupted by external cannabinoids? So there's just not a lot of data, but there is some data. Um, one retrospective review showed no increase in the time it took for women to get pregnant when they were cannabis users. Several other studies in humans showed that there was reduced fecundability. Um, and so really its effect on the ability to conceive is not known. Um, here's a study um, where they looked at um, women with infertility and compared um, those two women with proven fertility that were recreational drug users or cannabis users. So they found that women who reported smoking cannabis had a slightly elevated risk for infertility due to an ovulatory abnormality like anovulation. And the risk was the greatest among women who'd used marijuana within one year of trying to become pregnant. This study um, was done by Plowden et al, and they performed a small secondary analysis of a randomized controlled trial um, that examined the time to pregnancy and the effects of alcohol, tobacco, and marijuana. And they found that marijuana or cannabis use in the preceding year was associated with a delayed time to pregnancy. The ETS has also been linked to polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, remember that PCOS is a syndrome where women have 
anovulation or oligoovulation. Um, so amenorrhea or oligomenorrhea, um, they might also have insulin resistance. It increases their risk for metabolic syndrome. They can have little tiny cysts on their ovaries. They can have facial hair acne, that's PCOS. And so we know that the ECS plays some role in PCOS, but we don't know exactly what that role and mechanism is. So 2-AG, AEA, the endocannabinoids, and the receptors are upregulated in women with PCOS. So what about pregnancy? This is super important. Um, this information comes from uh, ACOG, the American College of OBGYN, and their recommendations. Um, so THC um, crosses the placenta. So if you use cannabis, THC and other cannabinoids are going to get to the baby. Fetal blood levels are 10% of maternal levels after an acute exposure. Um, for people who are chronic users, higher fetal concentrations um, occur. Um, but it's really hard to assess the effects of preg on the, the effects of cannabis on pregnancy because it's often used in conjunction with other drugs, especially tobacco, which we know can has so many detrimental effects to a developing pregnancy. Um, and it's really hard to tease out what was the cannabis, what was lifestyle, what was tobacco, what were you know what was stress, other things like that. Um, so what we know is, is limited and, you know, in pregnant women, we don't give them cannabis and then measure what happens, which is definitely the right thing to do. But I think this is really important to be aware of because I think there is a big movement, at least in Missouri, for pregnant women to be using cannabis for nausea. And I worry sometimes that women go to dispensaries and, and they're getting information from the dispensary that here, take it for nausea. And it works for nausea, but here's what the American College of OBGYN says about using it in pregnancy. So, and this is, you know, these, these bullet points here are for providers, for you all that are seeing women before they get pregnant, during their pregnancy and postpartum. So before pregnancy and in early pregnancy, all women should be asked about their use of marijuana, which is what ACOG, this is verbatim from the ACOG. Women who use it should be counseled about the poten potential adverse health consequences and the fact that we don't know, we don't have great data on what, what, what it does to a developing pregnancy. And women who are pregnant or contemplating pregnancy should be encouraged to discontinue use. Um, studies in animals show that using cannabis during pregnancy does affect brain development and function. There does not seem to be an association between cannabis use in pregnancy and the risk of a baby dying after birth, but the risk of stillbirth may be modestly increased. Um, and like I mentioned, there are limitations to the data that we have um, in cannabis use in pregnancy and studies are heavily confounded by co-use of other things like tobacco. What about breastfeeding? What should we be telling our patients who use cannabis about lactation? And basically the ACOG compendium sort of sums this all up in one sentence, that there's insufficient data to evaluate the effects of marijuana use on infants during lactation and breastfeeding. And in the absence of such data, marijuana use is discouraged. So now let's turn to what I consider the fun stuff. Um, let's talk about pelvic pain. Um, and I hope I'm not running out of time, but I'll, I'll keep going. So you all can interrupt me if I run out of time. Um, let's talk about pelvic pain. So there are a variety of different types of pain. There's nociceptive, neuropathic, and centralized. So nociceptive is the kind of pain, like if you take your finger, you put it in a burning flame, it'll burn. There's inflammation or damage. Neuropathic pain is pain that's like in the nerves themselves. So like diabetic neuropathy or post-herpetic neuralgia. <laughs> and then centralized pain is where your brain sort of learns that there's pain that's going on. So you see this in fibromyalgia or interstitial cystitis. The brain sort of rewires itself once there's been chronic pain to think that there's always pain. One thing I wanna point out is that when it comes to chronic pain and the data, it is very well established that cannabinoids lessen chronic pain. This is well established in the literature. 
Yeah. So when it comes to chronic pelvic pain, if you're a gynecologist or you take care of women, this is fairly common. And in my practice, it's very common because I specialize in chronic pelvic pain and dyspareunia and things like that. And so chronic pelvic pain accounts for about one in 10 outpatient gynecology visits. Prevalence estimates range from 5.7 to 26.6%. It's an indication for surgeries, laparoscopies, hysterectomies. It's a common problem. And women with chronic pelvic pain commonly have a neuropathic component to their pain. Um, so women with chronic pelvic pain many times will have endometriosis, irritable bowel syndrome, painful bladder syndrome, or interstitial cystitis, musculoskeletal pain. And there's often a neuropathic component to their pain. And there's evidence that cannabis has its greatest impact on chronic neuropathic pain. So it would make sense that it would work for chronic pelvic pain. Um, a meta-analysis assessed the effects of cannabis on neuropathic pain and concluded that inhaled cannabinoids improve pain by 30% in one of every five to six patients. And I find this interesting, a 2014 consensus statement of the Canadian Pain Society put cannabinoids as a third line treatment for chronic neuropathic pain. So they work well for neuropathic pain. There's another theory out there, this, um, this theory about an endocannabinoid deficiency. This was put out by Ethan Russo, Dr. Russo. And the idea is that this endocannabinoid deficiency is a condition where patients have abnormally low endocannabinoid levels, and that leads to chronic pain syndromes like fibromyalgia, irritable bowel, other treatment resistant syndromes. It's a similar concept to what happens in Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, right? Alzheimer's, you have low acetylcholine, Parkinson's, you have low dopamine. So his theory is that if the ECS tone were low, that could lead to excessive pain. It's an interesting thought. And then I also want to point out when it comes to cannabis and its treatment of chronic pain is there's not just cannabinoids in cannabis. There are terpenoids and flavonoids. The terpenoids, by the way, give cannabis its aroma, the specific smell. Um, but these also have been shown to have analgesic properties. So I'm going to make sure and I'll go back to the chat at the end and answer all these questions. So let's talk about endometriosis. Endometriosis is when the tissue inside the uterus, the endometrium implants somewhere outside of the uterus. So you can see here on the right, there's implantation on the outside of the uterus, on the ovaries right here, on the bowel. It causes local inflammation and scarring, and it causes chronic pain. I already said that. And women with endometriosis not only have chronic pelvic pain, but they have painful sex, pain with bowel movements. Typically they have severe menstrual cramps and then eventually their pain is just all the time. So what about the endocannabinoid system and endometriosis pain? Um, so, so the endocannabinoid system interacts um, or it's part of how women perceive pain, both nociceptive, inflammatory, and neuropathic. And so women with endometriosis, it would make sense that cannabinoids could help their pain. Interestingly, the ECS may have a role in the development of endometriosis. Endocannabinoids themselves have been shown to trigger endometrial cell migration. CB1 receptors have been found on the sensory and sympathetic neurons that innervate the endometriosis lesions. So we know that endometriosis pain and the endocannabinoid system are connected somehow, but we, we still haven't worked out the final details. Um, there's evidence that a disruption of the ECS potentiates pain in women with endo and giving somebody cannabinoids appears to correct this disruption in in vitro studies. Both synthetic and natural cannabinoids decrease the release of inflammatory modulators. Inflammation plays a big role in endo, and they also inhibit the growth of new blood vessels, which affects the growth of new endometriotic lesions. So, you know, all that's fine and dandy. It's, you know, evidence from like, you know, in a little test tube or in animals or whatever, but what are women doing? So I found that this is an interesting study. Um, in this Australian study, women rated cannabis as the most effective self-management strategy when they had endometriosis in controlling their pain. 
There's no studies that have anything to do with vulvodynia in cannabis, um, but biologically, it kind of makes sense, and I'll explain why. There is one retrospective study that reports that 7% of women with vulvodynia did medicate with cannabis. Um, and a mouse model of chemically induced vulvodynia showed that treating with topical THC led to decreased pain sensitivity and a decrease in mast cell density in the affected tissue. So why would that be? So we know that there are TRPV1 receptors in the vulva. We already know that capsaicin binds to these TRPV1 receptors and capsaicin is a known treatment for vulvodynia. I never use it though, because it apparently causes a lot of pain first before it fixes the pain. But cannabinoids also bind to that TRPV1 receptor. So it makes biologic sense that cannabinoids would help with vulvodynia, although we don't have substantial data to, to prove that. I'm gonna talk now a little bit on cannabinoids and sexual function. Um, I'm gonna start by saying sex is complicated. We all know that there are a lot of things that play into normal sexual function. It's not only testosterone, um, but it's hormones like estrogen, oxytocin, prolactin, and then neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, and norepinephrine. And there's a theory that normal sexual function depends on this balance between things that are sort of pro-sexual and things that are inhibitory to sex. Um, so it's this nice balance, a nice mix of neurotransmitters and hormones in the right levels. And when something affects that, that's when things get out of whack, kind of like the SSRI medicines, the antidepressants like Prozac, Zoloft, Paxil can lower your sex drive and inhibit your ability to reach orgasm. So there's a thought that cannabis affects sexual function through two main pathways. It regulates the release of serotonin and dopamine from neurons, and it also affects your hormone levels through affecting GnRH. So what do we know about using cannabis and what it does to sexual function? So of course, there's not a lot of data. Um, there's data in animals. Um, which is a little bit more scientifically sound, but it's animals. And then there's data in humans, which really relies on human recall and questionnaires. So when they looked at rats, there are several studies that show that if you give rats cannabis, there's an increase in receptivity and proceptivity. So receptivity is measured by lordosis, which you can see is the female rat arching her back, which signals she's ready for copulation. And then proceptivity is courting. So little rats, they make these hops and darts and they make little noises to attract mates. Um, so in animal studies, you give animals THC, um, they're mostly beneficial to sex. That's THC. So THC is mostly beneficial to different sexual domains, meaning receptivity, proceptivity, sexual motivation, things like that. But when you give other natural and synthetic cannabinoids, there are mixed results. And you can see that here. What about human studies? And like I said, human studies are based on questionnaires um, and there's a variety of them. So according to cough, the effects of marijuana appear to be dose dependent, which makes total sense because if you use too much and you can't move, that's not gonna do you any good. Um, some studies have shown increased mental and interpersonal contact with the sexual partner, increase in the intensity of orgasm. Um, so in human studies and questionnaires, it appears to be beneficial. So this is the study that we did at um, St. Louis University. Um, and this study came out of a sort of a desire to know what women thought about using cannabis and how it affected the sexual experience because we couldn't in Missouri um, give women cannabis and see what happened to their orgasm or their libido. And it sort of grew out of, I, I worked in a, a sexual dysfunction clinic, women with sexual problems. And I noticed that women would come to me and say, hey, you know, I have low libido, what can I do to fix this? But by the way, when I use cannabis, it's better. Or I can never reach orgasm, but when I use cannabis, it's better. So that prompted me to wonder what the data showed in the, in the medical literature. And when you go to the medical literature, there's just not a lot. Um, but if you go to the internet, the internet will tell you that marijuana or cannabis is like the aphrodisiac of the century. Um, so that's what prompted this study. So the goal was to determine women's perceptions of how marijuana 
affected the overall sexual experience, desire, orgasm, lubrication, and sexual pain. And you can see that according to our questionnaire, um, which was done in a OBGYN office, anybody who walked in um, 18 and older was given a questionnaire and the opportunity to fill out the questionnaire. You can see that in general, the majority of women reported an improved sexual experience and improved sex drive, improved orgasms, and less painful sex, so less dyspareunia. Dr. Lynn, the, the, yeah. um slides are not advancing. Oh, they're Recall advancing. The human studies slide. Oh, really? Mine is advancing. What do you think I should do? Maybe try to stop share and then reshare. Okay, let's try that again. Is it sharing now? Yes, we can see. Yep. Yes. Okay. Okay, so this was the slide I just finished up, overall positive impacts on experience, drive, orgasms, and dyspareunia. And then uh, lubrication was kind of mixed. Um, in our study, we also found that women who use cannabis before sex were 2.13 times more likely to report satisfying orgasms in their general life than women who did not use it before sex. And women who used marijuana more frequently were 2.1 times more likely to report satisfactory orgasm. Um, this is another study from Weeby and Just. And in this study, they had 216 questionnaires from people with experience using cannabis. 63% of the respondents were female, 30% were frequent cannabis users. And they found that the, the majority of people found that cannabis helped them to relax, heighten sensitivity to touch, and increase intensity of feelings, thus enhancing the sexual experience. Others in this cohort found that cannabis interfered by making them sleepy and less focused or had no effect on their sexual experience. This kind of shows you that for women, it looks like um, more women um, found that cannabis made it easier to orgasm, but also more women found that cannabis use uh, before sex made it more difficult to focus. There are some big problems with studies of cannabis and sexual dysfunction. There's recall bias, the dosage is unknown, confounding factors aren't taken into consideration. So obviously as with all things cannabis, more research is needed and the benefits and risks of use should be discussed if someone is going to, if, if a patient asks you, should I be doing this? So one question I get asked all the time is, oh, wow, look at your study. Do you recommend cannabis to all your patients? No, 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 right? There's, there's risks and benefits. So, and you know, if somebody's interested in using cannabis around the sexual experience, by all means, be in a safe place with somebody you trust. You know, this isn't something you should test out in an unsafe space. So, and you can always test it out by yourself without a partner, just in case you don't have the reaction that you expected to have. So we also get the question, well, why? Why does cannabis appear to improve the sexual experience? And there's a couple of theories, maybe a decrease in anxiety, heightened sensations, slows down the perception of time. So I wanna turn now to medical cannabis because this is an evolving area. And you might have some patients who come to you and they have another provider who's giving them cannabis and you're like, oh, I don't know, what is this dose? What is it doing? And the way that we look at this is the most appropriate medical dose and approach is the one that provides a precise dose for the desired duration in the appropriate form with fewest side effects. And the goal with medical marijuana is not to get high. And I feel like when you talk about medical marijuana, people are like, I don't wanna be stoned. I no, uh, uh, but that's not the goal. You don't have to be stoned to use medical marijuana for the treatment of certain medical conditions. So when you when you do it, you always start low, right? You start with the lowest dose and go really slow. You start super low and you can always go up if you need to. 
And how you use it depends on the desired effect. So um, edibles take the longest to take effect because they have to be absorbed um, through the GI tract, whereas smoking, vaping, those are the fastest effect. Um, and you can use a combination of CBD and THC. So you can make use of that entourage effect. So that way the CBD can take away that high feeling um, and I have found this in like a one-to-one -one ratio of CBD, THC, the majority of people don't feel high. If they do feel high, you can do a five-to-one ratio, five times CBD and one of THC. Um, oh, let's see, I kind of already said this, um, but CBD and THC are both used to relieve pain, anxiety, seizures, nausea, although they work through different mechanisms. But when they're combined, this, they can enhance each other's benefits and reduce the negative effects. So when it comes to ways that you can use cannabis, I don't ever recommend smoking cannabis to anyone um, because of combustion. Um, when you get it to such high temperatures, it produces toxins, kind of like tobacco smoke. So vaporizing and e-pens, and these are you know, regulated vape pens, um, deliver cannabis, but they keep the temperature well below the level at which it combusts. So it doesn't create those toxins that are associated with smoking a joint. Um, the onset of action edibles are the slowest. Um, and remember that their P concentrations occur in two to seven hours, and it can take one to two hours before a patient will notice an effect. So the last thing you want to do as a patient is eat an edible and be like in 10 minutes, oh my God, I don't feel anything and eat more. And then you still don't feel anything and eat more. And that's how people end up in the emergency room with terrible paranoia. Smoking or vaporization is fast. Um, the issue with this, when it comes to being sort of somebody who recommends this to a patient is an edible comes in a dose that says 2.5 milligrams or five milligrams. So for me, I'm like totally used to medicines that come that way. But vaping or smoking, how much medicine a patient gets depends on the size and the duration of the inhalation. And experienced users are more efficient in absorption. There's also sublingual in the form of tinctures or buckle where you put it in your cheek. This is still sort of still rapid onset, just not as rapid as vape pens. And the other thing about dosing um, THC, CBD is that more is not better. Um, you can see from this curve, there's an optimal dose that's kind of middle of the road and you it's um, decreasing returns the higher that you go. So just to sum it up, the endocannabinoid system plays a huge role in women's health in general and in human reproduction. I do not recommend that anybody uses it during pregnancy or lactation. Endometriosis pain may be particularly susceptible to treatment with cannabinoids and time will tell. Um, I'm looking forward to more data on that um, because endometriosis is a horrible disease. Um, and then several aspects of sexuality appear to be improved with cannabis, cannabis use at moderate doses. My opinion is there's a potential role for medical cannabis to have potentially huge benefits to patients. It's a medicine like anything else. I feel like it's just gotten a quite a negative stigma over the years, um, but you know, it's medicine just like anything else. So there are risks and benefits and side effects. So I want to end it there. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. I feel very grateful that I've had the chance to talk with all of you. Um, I love social media, so um, please follow me. Um, my, my practice is Evora Women's Health. I also um, have YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, um, and um, I've done a couple podcasts on sex and marijuana. I've done Dan Savage and some other ones. So um, if you're interested in that, um, you can find those on the internet. If you have any questions, you're always welcome to email me. You're never bothering me. You can see my email down here, drlinnadivorawomen.com. Um, and here is our website if you're interested. So I'm happy to take questions. So let's see if I open the chat. When I can, I can give one to you. Thank yeah. you so much for doing okay. this. Sure. Um, one of the questions that came up was about the cyclical vomiting syndromes and the association with marijuana use and that um, 
sometimes, you know, particularly when we see it used in pregnancy, that it actually makes vomiting worse. Is yep. there information that you can give about that or? Um, no, but that does happen. Um, I don't recommend it in pregnancy, but yeah, they can get into that cyclical vomiting syndrome. Um, but if you're going to, you don't know that until you try it. If you know, are you going to be somebody who has that response or somebody who would actually help? Um, but yeah, no, that, 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 that can happen. The other issue that, um, and actually I raised it because I, I work on tobacco. And so this is something that's come up with us is, you know, vaping, um, is not generally considered safe because of the other chemicals like the propylene glycol and the vegetable glycerin. And I do know that the ends and vaping associated uh, lung injury that Uvali cases, the majority were associated with vaping THC. So is that something that folks who are prescribing um, medical usage are thinking about, or is it something that they're weighing and how do you kind of take that into consideration? Yes. So, you know, so in Missouri, where I am, I'm in St. Louis, recreational marijuana is not legal. So, so the cannabis industry is highly regulated. So like the vape pens that you buy in a medical dispensary, you know exactly what you're getting. You're not going to get some of these weird oils when you get vape pens on the street. So I feel a lot more comfortable knowing that, you know, you know exactly what you're getting. It's highly regulated here. So um, you don't run into some of those dangerous um, oils that cause lung injury. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions? Please feel free to chat them in or to take yourself um, off mute because we're a small group today. Um, so feel free to chime in with questions. And we've also put an evaluation link in the chat um, for folks to provide their feedback. We're getting some thank yous, everybody's appreciating it. And also just while we're um, letting people chat in their questions, just share our social media properties as well. Um, please make sure that you're subscribed to our newsletter. Um, and if you aren't, uh, then they are archived on Before and Beyond where you can reach out to Suzanne to get subscribed. And so just thank you for all of that. And let's see here, do we have anything else? I think that was it so far. Do a last call for questions. Okay. Thank you so much, Dr. Lynn, for this very informative no. webinar. It's great. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Thanks for joining us. You too.